Thank you again for your financial support for Churches of Christ Disaster Relief. And thank you again for allowing me to come and be with you this morning. It's always good to go and meet new people, go someplace you've never been before, and uh, get acquainted with one another. One of these days, the traveling days may come to an end. I was telling someone a few moments ago that someone asked my grandson, when will your grandfather retire? He said, he won't. He'll die in a pulpit somewhere. So what better place? I'd preached for a number of years and I had never missed a term. I'd never missed a class. I'd never missed a sermon. I'd never missed a Bible study that I was supposed to be involved in until one Sunday morning. We met with the men before services and I said, I'm not feeling very good today. I said, uh, I may not be able to complete my lesson. And somebody said, well, leave your notes. And, uh, and sure enough, I got about halfway through the sermon and I had to leave. And I was so glad I made it to the restroom instead of losing what was in my system all down the aisle. And I said, the first time I ever missed a sermon was I got sick in the pulpit. And so, you know, things can happen. I want to read a text that all of us are very familiar with and draw a few points from it. We call it the story of the Good Samaritan. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and following. But what led up to it was that uh, a fellow had come to Jesus and he wanted to put him to the test. He really wanted to entrap him, to ensnare him, to get him to say something he could find fault with so he could go and tell everybody else, you know, we don't need to listen to this man anymore. And he asked him, will you tell me what I must do to inherit eternal life. And maybe the lawyer was surprised when Jesus did not answer that question. But told the lawyer, you're familiar with the law. What's your reading of it? What's your understanding? And he said, it's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, that's correct. You want eternal life, do that and you will live. But the lawyer wasn't satisfied. He had another question he wanted to ask Jesus. If I'm to love my neighbor as I love myself, tell me who my neighbor is. Now remember, we're back in the first century. We're among Jewish people whose thinking then maybe it's different than the thinking of many of us today, but it may be the same. That they thought the only neighbor they had was a fellow Jew. If you did not descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and on down the line, you couldn't be my neighbor. A Gentile couldn't be my neighbor. As we get into the story a minute, the Samaritan couldn't be my neighbor. And maybe some of them, even within the Jewish community, the Pharisee might say, I'm not sure the Sadducee can be my neighbor because he doesn't believe in the resurrection. He doesn't believe in angels. So maybe in answering this question, Jesus will slip up and the lawyer can find fault. But again, I'm have an idea the lawyer was surprised when Jesus didn't say this person is your neighbor this one is, and this one is not but rather he tells him a story tells him a story that 
We come to call the story the Good Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Simple story, isn't it? Then Jesus says, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. A simple story about a man traveling alone on a road going from Jerusalem to Jericho. I don't know why this man traveled by himself. The road was known to be robbers and thieves at different places. People normally would travel in groups to protect themselves. Several years ago, I was in Jamaica, and I had to go someplace, and I went by myself, and when I came back to the area where we were staying, and the man who owned the villas we rented said, where have you been? I told him. He said, which way did you come home? And I told him, and he shook his head. He said, I don't travel that road. You're fortunate that nobody bothered you. That road is known to be a dangerous road where people lie in ambush to take advantage of people. And that's what happens here. These thieves, these robbers are out there, and they're just waiting on someone to come along like this man by himself. And they jump him. They outnumber him, they overpower him, they strip him of his clothing, everything he has, they wound him, they leave him lying there half dead, unable to help himself. Well, as he is lying there, can, can you envision in your mind, here's a man lying here on the side of the road, he, he's half dead, he's wounded, he's bleeding, he can't help himself. He needs someone to come and find him and rescue him. And lo and behold, look who comes. A priest. We're under the law of Moses. The priest still officiate at the tabernacle in Jerusalem. What better person to arrive on the scene at this time than a priest? Because he is a man of God. He is God's man. But you know that priest just glanced at this man. And he got over on the other side of the road as quickly as he could and continued his journey. Now, I don't know whether he was walking, riding an animal, or riding in a cart, but he gets away from that man as quickly as he can and leaves him there to die. And Jesus said, another man comes. He's a Levite, which means he's a member of the Levite tribe from which the priesthood comes. And you, again, you would think, this is God's man or a man of God. He's going to do something and the Levite comes and he looks upon the man. He paused long enough. He saw the man lying there and he looks upon him. And surely what must have been going through his mind? This man needs help. Should I help him? No. He does the same thing that the priest did. He gets on the other side of the road as far away from him as he can, continues his journey, and leaves that poor man there to die. Doesn't say too much about those two men, does it? 
another man comes. He's a Samaritan. Everybody in the story thus far who are identified are Jewish, are they not? The lawyer is, Jesus is, the priest, the Levite both are. The thieves may have been. It doesn't say the man lying there dying may have been. I don't know. But the Samaritan is not Jewish. And again, go back to the first century. What did the Jewish people think about the Samaritans? Nothing. Nothing good anyway. They would not associate with them. And if they did, they'd become unclean. They avoided them. They thought they were inferior to them. But this Samaritan comes, and he sees the man lying there and says he has compassion or he has pity upon him. Undoubtedly, that's something the priest and the Levite did not have. But the Samaritan did. Makes no difference who this man is. Makes no difference whether he's Jewish, Gentile, Samaritan, or whatever. He had compassion upon him because he sees that he needs someone to help him or he's going to die lying there. So he administers first aid. Use something for bandages. Use oil and wine on the wounds. Put him on his animal. Takes him to an inn. Takes care of him the remainder of that day and that night. The next day, for whatever reason, the Samaritan is traveling. He must continue his journey. But the wounded man is brought into the inn the night before. He's not able to travel. What am I going to do? He gets the innkeeper. Gets him to denarii. So now if you spend more than that in taking care of him, you let me know when I come back and I'll repay you. Simple story. Who's my neighbor? So Jesus now turns to the lawyer and says, it's time for you to answer your question. You know, the lawyer had to answer his first question. Jesus didn't. Now he's going to have to answer his second question. Who was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the thieves and the robbers? He said, oh, the one who showed mercy upon him. I wish that Jewish lawyer would have said the Samaritan. But he answered the question correctly. The one who showed mercy upon him was the Samaritan. And then Jesus tells this proud Jewish lawyer, I want you to do what the Samaritan did. I want you to follow the example of this Samaritan. Well, what did he do? One, he saw someone who needed him. Saw someone who couldn't help themselves. Who needed someone to come along and provide assistance. And when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. And because he had compassion, he did what he could do. Administering the first aid by the roadside. Take him to an inn. Continue to take care of him. And then when he couldn't complete the task, he got someone else to do so. Yes, the innkeeper. Very simple, isn't it? Do you think the story ends there? Do you think only this Jewish lawyer is told, go and do likewise? No. Don't you think it applies to you and me too? Go and do likewise. Go and do what the Samaritan did. When you see someone that has your need or needs help, needs assistance, have compassion upon them. Don't pass by on the other side. It's so easy to pass by. So easy to say, well, we have good elders. They'll take care of it. We have some good deacons. They can take care of it. We have a good preacher. He can take care of it. We have some other good people. They're, they're more qualified than I am. They're more able to do it than I am. They can take care of it, and I'm just going to pass by. It's easy to do that. I've done that before, haven't you? There have been times I have just simply passed by. But God doesn't want me to pass by. We have opportunities day after day after day of reaching out with compassion, 
with pity, with mercy to people who are in need. We have those opportunities. And my question is, do we pass by on the other side or do we do what we can do? When illness comes to a family, when death comes to a family, when tragedy comes, what do we do? You know, I was telling Mark that he, he said, I'm not used to people being here this early. I said, well, my dad always thought if he wasn't the first one at the church building or 30 minutes before time, he was late. And I just it sort of ingrained in me. There's some things that we do, and sometimes maybe we don't. Our oldest son died two years ago. Ever since our children were little, we always did something for their birthday. And even after they become teenagers, we continue to do it. After they married, we continue to do it. On their birthdays, we'd write that happy birthday check. And I know the po people at the post office used to laugh when they'd see the envelope because Betty's written all around the back of it, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Well, can't send Michael a check anymore. But what we do, we split what we used to give him. We give Half of it, in his memory, the day that he died, November the 11th, to disaster relief. We give the other half on his birthday, January 13th, in his memory, to disaster relief. We do that out of respect for Michael, but we also know that those donations are going to help people like the folks down in Tennessee yesterday who were affected by tornadoes. People lost their lives, people were injured, people lost their homes, their cars, their possessions. And it's just a way of showing compassion and respect at the same time. There's other ways that we can minister to people. The second time I went to Cuba on a mission trip, one of our members of the church that worked in DC in the border patrol office, and we always gave him a phone number where I could be reached, and he gave me a phone number in case I got into trouble that maybe we could reach that number. And he calls me. He said, Betty fell. She broke her ankle. She's in surgery. I'll call you back tomorrow and let you know how things go. Our grandson was staying with us, he and his mother, and because she'd been a single mom most of her, his life. He was in Head Start, and he was the last one that the bus driver would bring home. You see, when the surgeon put her ankle back in place and pinned it together, he didn't want her walking on it. Put a big cast on it. Said, you use a walker and you can hop on your other foot. Well, Vicki, the bus driver, Betty gave her a key to the house. And Vicki had unlocked the door and let Caleb in. 
She's doing her part. This little five-year-old boy would go check on his grandmother. Granny, would you like something to eat? I'll fix you a sandwich. And he'd go and get the peanut butter and the jelly and the bread and fix them both a sandwich. It's a simple thing. But for a five-year-old, he was being a neighbor to his grandmother. There's so many things we can do in times of troubles. You know, a family may need transportation. They may need somebody to take care of their children. They may need the grass mow. They may need the snow shovel. They may need some food. They may need just someone to show compassion. I grew up in a family that did not show affection. My dad died at 49. I was 20 years old, brother older than me and a sister younger. And I'm sure somewhere along the line, mom and dad kissed one another. But you know, I never saw them. We just didn't show our affection for one another. <clears throat> Betty's family is just the opposite. They were hugging trees before anybody ever thought about it. <laughs> they hugged anybody and everybody. I had to learn to be a hugger. Oh, I'm so glad I did. Because sometimes... Giving a hug or receiving a hug is one of the best things you can do for a person. Just a good, genuine hug. Which says, I love you. I care for you. I feel for you. We can pray for people. We can write a note. We can send a card. I was looking through some things the other day and I saw this card and the person had written a note on it. He said, thank you for who you are. Words cannot express what you did and what you mean to our family. The only thing I did was stop by the hospital and visit When this little boy, who was born with all kinds of physical difficulties, when they wanted him to celebrate his birthday, and they said he liked school buses, I ordered him a school bus toy, had it sent to him. When he had to have a kidney transplant, I just wrote a check to help with some of their expenses while they were out of town. Not much. Little things. But she says, you don't know, you can't, words can't express what you mean to my family. Folks, let's don't pass by on the other side. We see that situation, we see that family, we see that need. Let's reach out and do what we can do. On a different scale, what about disasters? What about when those floods come and those tornadoes, those hurricanes, those wildfires, or whatever it may be, and people have been devastated? I don't know what it's like to lose everything I have. I don't know what it's like to have a flood come through my community. I don't know what it's like to have a, a wildfire or a tornado to hit. I have an idea of what a hurricane is like. Not because it hit home, but because I was in Jamaica when one came through and there's no place to go hide. I saw what a hurricane can do. I saw it rip a country apart, destroy everything that people had. This is 1988. A lot of the Jamaicans lived off of the land. 
all their fruit, all their vegetables, all their bananas, all these plants were destroyed. They harvested what they had, and then they couldn't harvest anything else. Understand a banana plant takes a year for it to produce a banana. So they're going to have to go a whole year without any new bananas to eat unless somebody gets some to them. I know what storms can do. I've been where tornadoes have hit. I've been where floods have gone through. The devastation is so bad. Little town in West Virginia, Raynell. This floods in West Virginia five, six years ago just went down through an area. Raynell was hit hard. More people lost their lives in that little town than any other place. I think there were 35 people who drowned as it went through. There's no congregation in Raynell. There used to be years ago, but it's not there anymore. How are we going to help the folks in Raynell? Some of the brethren up in Beckley, the North Beckley Church said, you get a truckload of supplies there, we'll be there, we'll distribute it, we'll help the people. That's what it's like being a neighbor. So we loaded that 53-foot trailer and sent it to Raynell, and those brethren from Beckley came down there, and they ministered to people. The state of Vermont, small New England state, nine congregations of the Lord's Church in that state. They range in size from nine to 49. Church in Springfield, Vermont's the largest congregation, 49 people. They had flooding recently. We'd worked with this church in Springfield before when they had flooding across the state line in New Hampshire. So we called them and they said, get us a truck as soon as you can. We're getting ready to contact others and really needed to go up there. My problem was I just had a shoulder replaced. My family said, you're not driving to Vermont. Folks at church said, you're not driving to Vermont. Dennis McClintock in Missouri, one of my coworkers, said, you're not driving to Vermont. I'll drive to Kansas City and I'll catch a plane and try, fly to Boston and I'll rent a car and I'll go to Vermont. That's what Dennis did. Little church in Mount Pier, or this small congregation made up mainly of older people, 13 or 14 folks. They said, how can we do this? Dennis said, let's get the town involved. So they got some of the authorities in town to find a place where they could unload a truck. You have some volunteers there to help unload it and help these small congregation minister to people. The church in South Burlington, they were spared from bad flooding, but a couple of towns just north of them were flooded. They said, if you'll get the supplies up here, we'll go to those two towns and we'll minister to the people. That's what it's like to be a neighbor. We just want to be there. There have been times when there's been disasters and the word comes back to us. You're the only one that sent any help. No government organization came. No other religious organization came. Only you came. Only you provided the things that we could use to help the people in our community. I think what it means when you can't get any supplies that you need to clean up after a flood and here comes somebody from the Church of Christ and they have all the cleaning supplies you need. They have the mops and the brooms and shovels and the rakes and the detergents and all that you need. I had a preacher to call me yesterday 
wants me to come to Tom's, Tom's River, New Jersey. We helped up there after Sandy came through. Small church. Used to be a fire-sized congregation until the military shut down their base. But they still want to help. They still want to minister. Well, the good that comes from it, you have a lot of people. You see a lot of tears. You get a lot of hugs. You get a new image in the community. People see the church differently. You feel different because of what you've been able to do. And people are converted. Let me tell you one conversion and then I'm going to quit. I've probably gone over time anyway. After Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans got all the news coverage because of all the deaths that were there that's taking place. But you know, Biloxi, Mississippi got hit by that same storm. We were working with the church there. And the story come back to us that there's a man came over and he said, uh, I understand you're helping people. And they said, yes. He said, well, I lost almost everything I have. And they said, well, what do you need? And they got the things for him and got his name and address and phone numbers and he went on his way. They're still doing the first responding. They hadn't had an opportunity to start following up. But this man comes back. And he comes back and he says, I want to tell you who I am. You have my name, but you don't know me. But this storm got my attention. And what I saw you do really has impressed me. You are helping anyone and everyone that had need, whether they were affiliated with the Church of Christ or not. You help me not knowing who I am. I want to come back and tell you who I am. If you come to part of the city where I live, everybody knows me. If you ask about me, they'd all tell you the same thing. If he's not the meanest man in town, he's one of the meanest. But you see, being a neighbor, having compassion, mercy, ministering to somebody changes his life. This mean man in town is now ready to open his heart because he tells them, I think I need to change the way I live. I don't know how long they studied with him, but he decided he wanted to become a Christian. And he was baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. Had Katrina never hit Biloxi, Mississippi, had the church never been there ministering to people, had that man ever come over, would that have ever happened? I don't know. But it did. And that's what it's all about. Maybe this morning you need to come to Jesus. You don't have to be the meanest person in Lancaster. Just one that knows I have sins that need to be forgiven. And the only way they can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus. And the only way I can contact that blood is confessing my faith in him, giving my life to him and being buried with him in the watery grave of baptism that my sins might be washed away. Or if there's any other reason you need to come to our Lord, would you come while we stand and sing?